Good morning. Oh, that was so good. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. The risen Christ is with us. Praise, Praise the, the Lord. Lord. Please stand as you are able and join me in hymn 400. I believe our screens may be out for today, so you may have to uh, pick up the old-fashioned hymnal here. All three verses. 400. Tune my heart to sing thy grace, streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise, teach me so risen Christ is with us. Amen? Amen? You may be seated. Welcome to Memorial United. I'm Ron Beaton, one of the pastors. What a joy it is to welcome you to worship today. I want to extend a special welcome to any guest who is with us today. If you're a guest, we hope you'll fill out one of the connect cards in the attendance pad as it gets passed down the road so we can get to know you a bit better. But we're particularly glad that you're with us today. Um, and I also want to welcome those who are joining us on our Facebook live stream or on YouTube a little bit later. We're so glad you're joining us today as well. If you want to get connected, I invite you to go to our website, memorialumc.church, and click on the Connect tab. At this time, let's continue our worship with our opening prayer. Sherry? Please follow along with your opening prayer. It's in your bulletin. Almighty God, whom truly to know is everlasting life, grant us so perfectly to know your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may steadfastly follow his steps in the way that leads to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. One more time. <laughs> We'll go up there. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. How are you all? All right. So how many of you all have a brother or a, 
a brother or a sister. Do you all, do you all ever wrestle with them? Do you all like to wrestle? Yes. You know, we call it wrestling where I come from. Do you all ever wrestle? Yeah? Yeah? Um, so do you ever get hurt sometimes when you wrestle? Right? Yeah. So do you think it's a good idea to wrestle your brother or sister? Um, maybe. Ma no, maybe not. Yeah. Yeah, probably it's a good way to get hurt, but I used to always enjoy wrestling with my brother when I was little. Of course, he was a lot bigger than me when I was little. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, well, I'm not going to encourage you to wrestle with your brother or sister, but do you think we can wrestle with God? Do you think we can? What do you think that means, to wrestle with God? Do you know what you believe about God? Do you know what you believe about God? Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes we're really sure, and sometimes we're not so sure, right? And we kind of have to wrestle to figure that out, right? Or maybe sometimes we um, wrestle with what we should do in life, with what God wants us to do, right? We know that God wants us to love other people, but the best way to do that is sometimes hard to figure out, isn't it? Sometimes, right? Maybe if somebody is being mean to you, it's hard to figure out how to be kind and loving to them, right? Well, in our story today, we're going to hear about Jacob. And you know what Jacob does? He wrestles with somebody. It's a stranger. We don't know if it's God. We don't know if it's a guy. We don't know if it's an angel. But we know that he wrestled. And when it was all done, he learned something really important, right? And that God loves him, right? Isn't that important for us to learn, that God loves us? That we can wrestle with that, but God loves us, right? 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 Right. All right. All right, let's put our hands together. And can you repeat after me, dear God, we love you, and we thank you that you love us too. Help us, even when we wrestle, to know more about you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, good to see you all. We had all the ladies up here today, didn't we? morning. I have two people coming to join me for special music. We have Paula Boyer and Ron on the keys. The blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary, the blood that he strained from day to day, it will never lose its power. It reaches
open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us this day. Amen. <clears throat> our Old Testament lesson <clears throat> today <clears throat> excuse me, is from the book of Genesis. <clears throat> <laughs> ah, chapter 32 verses 22 through 31 the same night he got up and took his two wives his two maids and his 11 children and crossed the ford at Debak. he took them and sent them across the stream and likewise everything that he had jacob was left alone and the man wrestled with him until daybreak when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And then he said, Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with the God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Penuel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose up on him, and he passed Penuel limping because of his hip. This is the word of God. Please stand as you are able. We will do hymn 386. Hymn 386, we will do verses 1, 2, and 4. Please remain standing as you're able for the reading of the gospel. Today's gospel lesson comes from Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. 
Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. In the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> I'm going to pull a sherry here. <coughs> I don't know um, how many times a year I say this. Um, this is one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. I probably say that more than I should, but today's scripture, like I really mean it. This is one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, certainly in the Old Testament. We're continuing our sermon series, Father Abraham and His Many Sons. Um, and this is week eight of this sermon series, which is the longest sermon series I've ever preached. Um, but I love this scripture because there's so much mystery in it, so many questions. And as I've said before, I always feel that a good question the story since last we met, right? So Jacob and his father-in-law, Laban, they were cut from the same cloth. Both were tricksters, always trying to stay one step ahead of the other, of everybody else. Like Survivor, they wanted to outwit, outplay, and outlast one another. Last week, we learned about how Laban tricked Jacob into marrying Laban's eldest daughter, Leah, before he married Rachel. In the verses that fall between last week's scripture and this week, um, the two engage in this high-stakes game of dueling farmers. Um, the agrarian shysters that they were make a deal where Laban would give Jacob all of the speckled and spotted land. And then, in some act of agrarian voodoo um, that I still can't really make sense of in the Bible, Jacob manipulates the sheep herd's offspring to be overwhelmingly speckled and spotted, the lambs, right? So ultimately, Jacob profits handsomely from this deal, and he becomes quite wealthy, which is another recurring trait amongst Abraham's family. They all become rich somehow. Laban then tries to cheat Jacob out of some of his wages. Laban's sons become angry with Jacob because they're convinced that he's stolen most of their inheritance. And then God comes to Jacob and says, you know, Jacob, it's probably best for you to get out of town um, while you still can. So while Laban was out of town, Jacob takes his wives and he gets his livestock. And Rachel actually takes some of the family idols, some religious um, stuff that was important to them, loads up the camels and sets out towards the home country. Jacob for the second time in his life, is a man on the run. Laban gets home from vacation. He learns of Jacob's flight, and he begins chasing after them. Laban pursues Jacob for an entire week until he finally catches up with his runaway family. But on the way, God had come to Laban and said, Look, I don't want you to kill Jacob. Don't harm Jacob. So he doesn't. But he does go to Jacob, and he painfully says to him, Look, you, you didn't even let me say goodbye. Like, I, I didn't even get to say goodbye to my daughters, to my grandchildren. And then he accuses Jacob of stealing the family idols. Jacob doesn't know that Rachel had done this. Um, it's a really kind of awkward story if you want to read that one. I think it's chapter 31. Then Jacob, in anger, upbraids Laban saying that he did his work and he was never treated fairly. And Jacob and Laban, they go back and forth with their difference. And finally, Laban interrupts and says, Look, your kids are my grandkids. Your wives 
are my daughters. Let's make a covenant and end this family feud and recognize that we both care about Rachel. We both care about Leah. We both care about our children and grandchildren. And so they make this covenant, and Laban gets up early the next morning, and he kisses his grandchildren and his daughters goodbye, and he blesses them, and then he returns home never to see them again. With that episode behind him, Jacob prepares to face a more menacing threat in front of him. He's going home to his brother Esau. Esau is going to be there waiting on him. The brother he tricked out of a birthright and a blessing. The brother who wanted to kill him. The brother who caused him to flee his home in the first place was still working the family farm. Jacob sends messengers ahead to Esau to figure out, just kind of test the waters a little bit. And the messengers come back and they say, um, Esau, um, he's on his way to meet you. He and 400 other men. <laughs> Which sounds more like a military exercise than a family reunion, doesn't it? So Jacob's options are limited. He could walk into the jaws of the lion and hope that time has healed the wounds. Just hope that his brother had forgiven and forgotten over the last 20 years, which seems unlikely. Two, he could try to manipulate his brother again. That tends to be Jacob's M.O., right? But after running away from his home, amassing huge sums of wealth, Jacob's right back where he was 20 years before. He's sleeping in the wilderness, scorpions running, running around, his head is laying on a rock for a pillow. He's uncertain that he's going to survive. Surely by now, Jacob's getting tired of this game. Or three, Jacob could figure out how to reconcile with his estranged brother, with whom he had spent the first half of his life wrestling and manipulating. Just as Laban and Jacob maybe made a covenant, maybe Jacob and Esau could make a covenant together. So Jacob tries to start off by kissing up to his brother, so he sends a ridiculous number of livestock to his brother as a peace offering, 220 goats, 220 sheep, 30 adult camels, and then their colts, 50 cows and bulls, 30 donkeys, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree, right? Then Jacob and his crew come to the Jabbok River. Jacob sends his wives across the river, his servants, his livestock, they all Across the river, but Jacob stays back. With the world around him in chaos, he decides he needs a little solitude. Just him and his thoughts. So there he is, by himself, under the stars, all alone. Or so we thought. Because then, without warning, out of nowhere, completely void of any context, Jacob is wrestling somebody. <laughs> and he wrestles all night long. It's the strangest thing. Was Jacob attacked? Did, did Jacob pick the fight? Who is this mysterious figure? We don't know who or what Jacob is wrestling. Where did he come from? Why is he there? Why did he seemingly jump Jacob in the night? How did he get there in the first place? The scripture begins by saying he's wrestling a man. What man was it? Was it Esau? Was it, was it one of Laban's sons who's still frustrated? Was it a dream? Was it literal or was it a metaphor? John Calvin argued that it was a vision, but, you know, in other scriptures in the Old Testament, it says when it's a vision. It doesn't indicate that in this place. There are several pieces of art of this scripture, right? And Jacob's wrestling an angel. Was it an angel, right? In the book of Hosea, the prophet says that Jacob was wrestling an angel. So which was it? Was it a man? Was it an angel? Was it God? In the book of Genesis, it, there seems to be some fluidity to how God is presented, right? Sometimes it's as a man, sometimes it's the angel of the Lord who seems to be like God in the flesh. Like when the angel of the Lord offers hope to Ishmael and Hagar while they're homeless in the wilderness. Or to Abraham when, when the sacrifice of Isaac is thwarted. By the angel of the Lord? Could this character's identity have some fluidity too? One sermon that I heard this week um, 
made the case that the mysterious man that Jacob was wrestling was Jacob, that he was wrestling with himself, with his own sense of identity, his own angels, his own demons. I find that compelling. Jacob is attacked mysteriously in the night and wrestles until daybreak. I know more than a few friends who were attacked in the night by their own anxiety, and then they wrestle to get it under control. The fears and the anxieties of life, some rational, some not, creeping up on you in your sleep. Could it be that the stranger in today's scripture was a panic attack? Anxiety isn't always attached to one thing, right? Sometimes anxiety strikes before the brain even knows what to latch on to. I wonder if you know that feeling. For Jacob, it was the destruction of relationships. Was it the thought of confronting Esau or the covenant he made with Laban? Was it the danger and fear of being left alone while his family had crossed the river? Was it the fear of losing everything he had? Did he even know what he was wrestling? <laughs> Jacob, Jacob wrestled with someone or something all night long. That's what Jacob does, right? It's what Jacob knows. Before he was born, Jacob was wrestling in his mother's womb with his brother Esau. When the twins were born, Jacob tried to wrestle his way to be the firstborn, grabbing his brother's heel in the birth canal. And he's been metaphorically wrestling for power and women and influence and wealth ever since. And now, after achieving all of that, he's back in the desert, with the risk of losing it all. Plenty to wrestle with there, isn't there? Jacob wrestled all night long, and then the scripture says that Jacob prevailed. Jacob had won the fight, but did he really? <laughs> because even though he prevailed, this stranger, with a simple touch, knocks Jacob's hip out of socket. Jacob's writhing in pain, but guess what? Jacob the fighter refuses to give up. He had the stranger pinned, and the stranger sees the sun beginning to rise along the horizon. And the stranger says, let me go, for day is breaking. But Jacob responds, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Unless you bless me, I will not let you go, which might be a good way to pray, right? Persistent, determined, Jacob was going to get something out of this skirmish. The stranger says, what is your name? He answers, I'm Jacob. And the stranger says, well, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with humans, and you have prevailed. The name Israel means God wrestler, or contended with God, or maybe even preserved by God. What a nickname that is. Hey, you want to go to lunch, God wrestler? And then Jacob continues, all right, I've told me your name, now you tell me your name. He finally asks the question we've all been wanting to know, right? Who is this? I need to have some claim over this. Will we finally know who the stranger is? Tell me your name. And the stranger says, why do you want to know my name? And then with a benediction, a parting blessing, the stranger disappears as mysteriously as the stranger appeared. Was it God, after all? Perhaps with a touch of a finger, it seems he can unravel hip joints. That sounds pretty supernatural. So does the mysterious entrances and exits. Unable to look at the sun, that seems odd. Wrestling in the dark. But not so fast. The Hebrew in verse 29 and 30 is the word Elohim, which is a word that means God, and it very well could be used to refer to the God of Abraham. But the term Elohim is actually more generic. Than that. It could also refer to other gods. It could also refer to angels. It could even refer to the spirit of a dead person. I don't know the who, what, when, why, where, and hows 
of what Jacob or who Jacob's was wrestling. I don't know the who, what, when, why, where, and hows of what you're wrestling either. I don't know if you're wrestling a human being or if you're wrestling God. I don't know if you're wrestling angels or you're wrestling anxiety. I don't know if you're wrestling with truth that has confronted you, truth that sounds like it's malignant, or she's died, or this isn't going to work out between you and me. Maybe you're wrestling with any number of current events, right? And you wrestle with all the evil and violence and, and war in the world, or any other front page headline for that matter. Wrestling with these things can be exhausting. You wrestle all night long. I don't know if you're wrestling with how a good God could allow bad things to happen to good people. I don't know if you're wrestling with your own sins, your own baggage. Are there Labans in your past? Are there Esau's in your future? Maybe you wrestle with being confronted by your own sin. That can be something hard to wrestle with. I'm not that sinful, am I? Could it be that I'm racist? Sure, I did this bad thing that nobody knows about, but it's a victimless crime, you say. Do you wrestle with that? Maybe it feels like you're wrestling with your own salvation. I wonder with whom or what you are wrestling. I wonder if you even know. Jacob didn't know. But it didn't stop him from wrestling. He was a fighter. Charles Wesley wrote that song we just sang, and probably most of you have never heard it because it only really makes sense to sing it whenever this scripture comes up. Um, but in my opinion, the, the lyrics to that song are Charles Wesley's magnum opus. I love what he does. He, he puts that scripture into lyrical form. Wesley's surprising insight is that he imagines Jacob inviting the perilous encounter. Come, O thou traveler unknown. Come, O thou traveler. Come, bring it on. Jacob never shrank before trouble, instigated plenty of it on his own. He's a fighter. Someone who weirdly enjoys conflict. The Bible portrays a God who enjoys it as well. What? What an odd religion that Israel and subsequently Christianity have. We can argue with God. We can do combat with the Almighty. God allows this. God welcomes this. God seems to want to relentlessly, ferociously, and with openness and honesty grapple with us. And then when we wrestle with God and with our own selves, what we find is we're going to prevail. If it hurts, if it turns out we never really had a chance of winning in the first place, we still prevail. We prevail because when we wrestle with God, we come away with a better knowledge of who God is and who we are in relationship to God. Whatever it is you wrestle with, if God is mysteriously involved, you're going to walk away changed. You're going to walk away with a limp. It's going to sting. It's going to hurt. Like Jacob, who walked away with a limp from his contorted hip, we will be marked by God forever. We normally call this baptism, right? But I think that's what Jesus is all about. Entering into our lonely mess and wrestling with us to bring us at last to that place where we've been made new where we're given a new identity, a new way of walking, a new life, a new name. We've wrestled with God and we will prevail. And by God's grace, we will be made new. Amen. Let's stand together as we affirm the faith of our baptism with the Apostles' Creed.
since we don't have the screens, I invite you to grab a hymnal and turn to page 12 for a service of word and table two. That'll have the invitation, confession, and pardon, and then later the great thanksgiving for our communion today. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us through joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Now, as a forgiven and reconciled people, let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God. Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And if you need to follow along, we're on page 13 in the hymnal. It is right, and it's a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. When Jacob wrestled with you during the night, you blessed him. And so you have blessed us, even as we have fought and wrestled with you, for you are truly gracious and holy. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. He showed us your love and compassion by feeding the multitudes. 
By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread and they gave thanks to you. They broke the bread and they gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, and he gave thanks to you, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. As we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. And now with boldness we pray, our Father, who art in heaven. us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. I invite those who are assisting me to come forward. Today, we'll receive communion by intention. That means you'll be given a piece of the bread, take a step to the outside, dip it in the cup, and then you can spend time at the kneeling rail if you would like in prayer, or make your way back around to your seats. Um, in the United Methodist Church, we have an open table. That means um, that all are welcome. Regardless um, of what tradition you come from, we recognize your baptism. For Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him. And so uh, if that's you, I hope that you will come and receive this meal. The feast is set. Won't you come to the feast? someone needs gluten-free, let me know, and we have that for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you.
please stand as you are able for our closing hymn. 370. 370, Victory in Jesus. We will sing all three verses. His blood's atoning, then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with His redeeming blood. few announcements as we send you out this week. Uh, first, normally we do this at the prayers of the people, but with communion we didn't have that today. Uh, VBS is this week, uh, starting tomorrow through Thursday. So we're reminded to pray for the kids who will be coming, as well as the adults and the volunteers, uh, that they would be drawn closer to God during this time. Then next week, starting Monday, is our mission week. Uh, so we still have lots of opportunities Monday through Saturday. If you haven't quite found what you would like to volunteer for, there's sign-up sheets out there or online. You can click on the link in your email. Uh, but we know that Habitat needs more volunteers. So if you are able on that Saturday to come out 9 to noon uh, and haven't quite decided what you want to do yet, that would be a great one to sign up for. And then the blessing of the backpacks will be in three weeks on the 27th. 
Uh, so come join with your backpacks ready for school or school started at that point and then we'll do our promotion Sunday during the 915 service. Thank you, Pastor Chris. Go forth from this place in a world where we wrestle sometimes all night with things that we don't even know, knowing that God will work through that to make all things new. In the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all of God's people said, Amen. go in peace. Oh, um, one thing I did want to highlight, particularly to this particular service, um, Evelyn Kincaid passed away this past week, and uh, her service will be here in the sanctuary um, tomorrow. Particularly if you're involved in this service, you know um, how much time and energy she put into this congregation and into this church, the number of meals that she cooked for, the number of um, ways that she participated in the life of the church. Is a long, there's a long litany. And so we'll celebrate her life tomorrow and recall um, her faith and the work of Jesus Christ and resurrection tomorrow. So if you can be there, we, um, it'll be at 11 a.m. tomorrow. And the visitation is at Cozine's this afternoon. I'm not sure the time, but I bet you can figure it out. It's four to seven, so go in peace. Thank you.